So good. How you doing? Just so you know, I like to have fun. If it's not fun, I usually don't like to do it. That's why my grass is getting long. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> I haven't been home for a few days. So, But I love being here. I'm so thankful that you have me. You don't even know me, so you couldn't even say no. But I love that I'm here with you this morning. I'm so thankful to Pastor Jason and his family for having us this morning. I'm, I'm riding solo, so if you look at me and I think I'm, you, you think I'm worried, it's because I am, because I don't have my wife, and I don't have my baby girl, so I'm like, I'm lost a little bit this morning. They're only like 45 minutes away, and I was this morning. Who here remembers the first time or like the first few times that you're actually away from your child? Yeah, and you're like, hold it together, man. This is like, you're 45 minutes for like a few hours, and you're going right back. I'm like, driving away, I'm like... I'm going to call Jason. Sorry, man, I can't do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> find somebody else. I'm telling you, it's, it's a weird thing when you have a kid. Something happens inside of you. But I don't ha- you don't have the privilege of meeting, but let me just do my best. Picture, well, maybe don't picture, but imagine the most beautiful woman in the world, the most intelligent woman. I know all the, they, smart man right there. <laughs> if this, this is an opportunity for all the men to be like, is he talking about you? I don't know why, but he's talking about you, okay? I sh- you can thank me later, gentlemen. But I'm telling you, I am lucky. I, I always usually joke when I introduce her, I'm like, she's the queen bee. I'm telling you, she, she is my queen. I would be lost without her. I would not be here without her. And so I am so lucky to have her as my wife. And we actually just celebrated our fourth year anniversary just a few days ago. You're like, you look too young for four years. I know. Thank you very much. I'm just so good. And w- we've just, we actually have a, I don't even know what day it is today. That's what happens when you have kids, right? Um, but actually, on the ninth, our baby will be celebrating her sixth month uh, of life. I don't know if it's a birthday or not, but I'm willing to give her presents. I'll give her whatever <laughs> she wants. She looks at me like that. I'll be like, I don't have anything, but here it is, right? But I love family. I love being married. Any married couples in this place? Anybody? Throw your hands up. Good. I love. If if you're single, look for the person who didn't put their hand up. That's I always love doing. <laughs> youth and young adults, I'm like, <laughs> we're going to pray and hold hands. So this is your now, now your chance to move seats and find the girl that you really liked. All right? Hold hands. If you want to date, squeeze, okay? <laughs> but I love it. It's so fun. Marriage is amazing. Who knows that Jesus planned for marriage to be amazing? Amen. Who knows that marriage is a gift from God, not just to actually be connected with one another, but also to actually see what our connection with God is actually supposed to be like. Amen. Who knows, he is the bride. We're the bride, sorry. I don't know, I'm married to him, so (laughs) I'm happy. But we're the bride, he's the bridegroom. So I'm like, man, if I could love my wife like he loves me, I'll be doing fine. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I do this every once in a while. If you're married, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you can't stand, don't worry. But if you're married, I'm going to ask you to stand. Because I like to celebrate marriage. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to increase the years, and when I get to your years, you can sit down, all right? Years of being married. So if you've been married two years or longer, I know, I'm like, hey, I'm only at four, guys. I got it. I'm going to be sitting down over here. You can't even see me. All right? Two years, four years. Now I got to sit down. I pretend I'm sitting down. Five years, ten years of marriage. All right, there we go. Fifteen 20, you're like, come on, boy, hurry it up. (laughs) I'm standing. (laughs) All right, 35 years. 40. All right, 40. What about 45? I feel like an auctioneer. I feel like, do we have anything? You're getting, you're going home with a podium. I'm sorry. (laughs) Jason's going to be so mad at me. Uh, 50. Oh, 48. All righty, so how long has it been? 53 years. Yes, seriously, so good. So for all of us who are under 10, we need to go find them, take them out for lunch, and be like, give us all the wisdom that you have, uh, like notebooks, tape recorders, anything you got. I love marriage. Seriously, my life and, and my wife and I, we've actually said like one of the things that we want our lives to be marked by is healthy marriages and healthy families. Who knows that church doesn't stop within the four walls, Amen. So if our church is healthy and our families are not, we're doing it wrong. <laughs> God's plan for the kingdom of God to come to earth actually looks like family. He was family before we were even here. We were created out of community from community. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
So I love, fa- I love family, I love marriage, and I want to I wanna find out, speaking of marriage, I want to see if any of the men in this, in this place can relate to me. Have you ever had that moment where your wife has to, basically, I feel like this is something that they, they weren't trained for, but they're good at. You come out, maybe it was for getting ready for church, you come out to eat breakfast, and you're dressed up, you're feeling good about your outfit, you know, like, this is like, I'm, I'm looking good today, like, man, people are going to be like, what, what did you do with your hair? I'm like, I don't have any. I just polished it up today. Like, it's just like, you're feeling on point. You're like, ready to go. And you come out to breakfast, <laughs> and your wife's like, honey, <laughs> um, I just want to let you know, like, your outfit is less than what it could be. <laughs> like, right? Like, and like my wife is too kind. If you met her, you would know she is too kind to pull this phrase. But anybody ever have the phrase said to them, like, is that what you're going to wear? <laughs> I don't even know what you, ex- like, what do you say to that? Like, no, actually, I, this is just what I was going to wear to eat breakfast. Like, <laughs> I dress up like this every morning. You know, it's like, of course this is what I was going to wear. And <laughs> I know, and I'm like, I was thinking, I'm like, did that happen today? No, I think it was good. All right, I, I planned ahead. But I'm telling you, like, I get to spend every day of my life with, with her, and I love it. And there are things in my life that have changed, that have grown. I, like, seriously, she pushes me to grow further than I thought possible. She allows me to be a better man. But probably the most, the area that has seen the most drastic change in my life because of her influence is my fashion style. My goodness gracious. I'm telling you, like, I believe in living for the future, not the past. So I've burnt all those pictures and I've deleted them off Facebook because nobody needs to see that outfit. Okay, I'm telling you. I was like, were you, did, did, are you sure you didn't have something going on with your eyes when you said yes to me? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I must have a great personality. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you, like, I could have been on what not to wear. That's how bad it was. I just, like, it was rough, guys. And one of the things that I realized is that in fashion, if you're not being intentional about the outfit that you're putting on, it's possible that you're putting on the wrong outfit. And intentionality is extremely important. This morning, what I want to tell you is that your life is speaking a message, whether you know it or not. And I feel like this morning, I'm speaking to the choir because I watch the recap video, and I, I know a little bit of of when I get together with Jason at luncheons and I hear about what's happening here. I know uh, Pastor Katie Finley really well. And so I get to hear what you guys do. I get to hear the amazing church that you guys are. And I love what you do in this community. So like, just bear with me. This is probably more for me than it is for you, okay? Just take notes and then photocopy them, give them to me. <laughs> but I love the fact that our lives are actually speaking a message, whether we're intentional about it or not. The way we live our lives, the way we speak, the way I act, is actually speaking a message to the generation right now. The very people living their lives right now are watching my life and hearing a message by the way that I live. And so this is what I want to ask. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, what is your life speaking? Like, oh, come on now, guys. You got to be loud. I'm telling you, I'm not even, I'm getting older. My hearing, my wife might say that my hearing's getting rough, but, but I work with youth, pe- youth pastors. So, like, you got to be loud. You got to make some noise. You can have fun in church. You can, don't break anything because he'll charge me, I, I'm sure. Of it. But have you ever wished that your life mattered? <laughs> Thank you. I was like, <laughs> check, check. No, I'm just kidding. Like, personally, I, I think about this. I don't like to think about funerals or my own funeral. But one thing I think about is at the end of my life, what I want my life to be known for. And not out of just a self absorbed thing, but actually of, out of a sense of like, what am I leaving behind? What kind of generation after generation after generation will receive blessings because of the way that I live my life? What kind of legacy and what kind of heritage do I leave my children and grandchildren because of the decisions that I make right now? And so I think about it, even as a youth pastor, I think like, I don't want to just lead a youth group. I love the students in our youth group. It's amazing. But what I want to lead is I want to lead a community of young people. 
I want to lead a city of young people. I want to lead a nation of young people. I want my life to matter. I want the message on my life to be something that actually causes history to change. And it seems like this big, far-off plan, but it's really what you and I are called to. And it's actually pretty easy. Because whether we're intentional about it or not, your life is speaking a message. It can either speak a message of hope, of goodness, of God's faithfulness, or it can speak a message of shame, of guilt, of brokenness. But it's literally just up to us. And so this morning, this is my question for you. is like, What is your life speaking? And to answer that question, it actually takes vulnerability. It actually takes self-reflection. I would, I would actually suggest that self-reflection is actually one of the greatest tools in the Christian life. Is that the moment that we get going so fast and we stop to all of a sudden say, hey, hold on, how am I doing internally? How am I feeling? What am I believing? We actually can get off course. But self-reflection, actual vulner- vulnerability and saying like, hey, I need you to come into my life so that I have people to speak into my life when I get off track is one of the greatest things that we can do to live out this life. And so when we ask that question, what is your life speaking? It actually takes vulnerability. And I, I, love, I love young people because they're, they're turning things around. They're actually saying like, I'm actually tired of living a fake life. The world is searching for authenticity. Anybody? Amen? I love that. I love The world is searching for authenticity. And you and I are part of God's plan. And who knows, we are plan A, not plan B. You and I are God's plan A, and there is no plan B. There's no like, oh, they didn't do it. No, it's like I put all my eggs in their basket because I knew it was worth it. I knew it was going to work out. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're plan A. Okay, we're getting louder. I like it. I like it. I like it. All right, if you got your Bibles, if you don't have your Bibles, I always tell our youth this. It's like going on a date without your girlfriend. All right, you go to church without your Bible. Come on, people. All right, so if you got your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter 2. And when you get there, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to yell at Walmart. If you don't like Walmart, yell at some retail store. But it's just a good way to make sure people are, like, actually looking in the Bible. (laughs) I'm telling you, I work with youth guys. Come on. They'd be like, I'm just on my phone checking Instagram. I'm like, open the Bible. Come on, people. So good. Anybody there? I I have not heard Walmart. Oh, so good. You're like, what did Jason do? Who did he bring in here? The heart store. Yes. So good. I know, I'm sorry. I'm not from Espanola. I'm like, I should have went and like ran around the mall real quick and been like, name one of these. Although I saw a movie gallery and I was like, I remember when Sudbury had one of those. It was awesome. And then we got rid of it. I can't believe. Is it not there anymore? Just the sign. I'm going to go talk to those people next time. Like, you, you ruined my sermon. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, if you're at First Peter 2, verse 9... Read 9 and 10, all right? And I'm going to read from the message translation. And so it says, But you are the ones chosen by God. Turn to the person next to you and say, You're the one. Especially if you're married, you'd be like, You are the one, honey. (laughs) But it says, You are the ones chosen by God, the ones chosen for a high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you, from nothing to something, and from rejected to accepted. You and I are who God wants to use to change this world. I love that. It gets me jacked up and juiced. You're like, what? I I say weird things, trust me. English is my fourth language. The other one's... There's not names for them. I just speak words and they come out. You're like, how did you become a pastor? Because I was bad at math. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so good. Here's the deal. If we want to determine what our lives are speaking, we actually have to be vulnerable. But, but one of the things that we have to do is we have to own our story. 
You might be like, what do you mean by owning your story? Is that God actually wants to use your story, your past, to bring breakthrough to the world around you. Who knows that your past is not supposed to be erased from your story? Jesus didn't come to get rid of your past. He came to transform it. I always love that. Jesus, everybody hung around Jesus. The prostitutes, the thieves, everybody hung around Jesus. And he never once ignored their sin. He just called them into their real identity. He would say, like, leave your sin, but go and live. And was like, and, and sometimes we get into this spot where we're like, I just want to forget my past. But in reality, your past is the very thing that can provide breakthrough for other people. That's a good word. If you're taking notes, yeah. write that down because it wasn't in my notes. Romans 8. I love Romans. Anybody else love Romans? You could just stay there for the rest of our lives and we'd be like, I still can't figure it all out. It's so good. Romans 8 says this. 819, for creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Who knows that, like, I'm so happy that you are not making creation wait anymore. Because you are revealing the sons and God to this community, the sons and daughters of God to this community. See, how we're revealed is simply by saying, like, I will let my life speak. When something is revealed, it's not a decision of whether it is something or it, it is what it is. Like, I think of this. Like, when I'm revealed as a father, guess what? Before anybody calls me a father, the moment I had my daughter, I was a father. I didn't need somebody to tell me, hey, you're a father. I was like, uh, I, I was in the room. <laughs> I'm a dad now. But there's a revealing that happens when I walk around with my daughter through the mall. And everybody's like, oh, he's a dad. And what happens is that you and I are sons and daughters of God with a a voice, with a message that can change the world. But by revealing who we are, by living it out, actually allows creation to say like, oh my goodness, the sons and daughters of God are being revealed. This is how God's plan comes to pass. I I do this. I'm not going to do it here because it's something you don't do on a first date. All right? (laughs) <laughs> I did this at youth camp because who knows, youth, if you offend them, they'll just forget by the morning anyways. But I do this. It sometimes is offensive, but that's one of my spiritual giftings. Um, I had a Bible, and I, I got up, and I was speaking, and I actually took the first five books of the Bible. It wasn't my Bible. It wasn't somebody else's Bible either. I found a Bible that was not been used for a very long time. And I took the first five books of the Bible, and I ripped them out. I know, usually when I say that, all the air leaves the building. I'm like, I'm going to bring it back in. I'm coming back. Don't worry. Trust me. Hang on. And then I went to the Psalms, and I ripped out all the Psalms. And then I went to the New Testament. I ripped out 13 books in the New Testament. And I saw I ripped out everything that Moses wrote, everything that David wrote, and everything that Paul wrote. And you you should see the look on their face. (laughs) They're like, is he okay? It's really hot. Did he get, like, sunstroke? (laughs) <laughs> and I'm just like, don't go tell your parents, okay? <laughs> but it's amazing, like, we will get offended by papers on the ground, yet you and I sometimes will rip our lives out of the story of God. And it's crazy to think, like, papers, and I, I love the Bible, trust me, like, don't, don't worry about that. I love the Word of God, but it's crazy that we will be like, oh my gosh, there's papers out of the book. And meanwhile, sometimes you and I will think that our past disqualifies us from being used by God in his plan and in his story of this earth, of his plan and story of what he wants to do in this earth, how he wants to bring heaven to earth, and we will rip our lives out, but nobody gets offended about it. See, like, I think about that. Like, if past, if my past could disqualify me, then, like, what happened with Moses? Moses killed somebody. Noah was a drunkard. Abraham lied and laughed at God. David slept with somebody and then killed somebody to cover it up. Think about Peter. Peter basically abandoned Jesus in his greatest time of need. And Paul killed Christians before he became one. Like, think about that as a resume. Like, hey, Jesus, um, 
I want to follow you, but like, do you just forget that? Yet Moses literally took God's people and led them out of slavery. Abraham is known as the father of faith. David, a man after God's own heart. Noah saves basically humanity. He preserves humanity. Peter, like God builds the church on Peter. And Paul basically has like changed the face of the world for Christ. See, your past cannot stop you from being used by God. Who knows that our setbacks in the hands of Jesus are actually setups for breakthrough. I love it. It's like a mess in his hands is a message. I got a test. Okay, cool. He'll make it a testimony. You see, like our lives, regardless of where we are, where we were today, and every day is a time where we can get an upgrade. Doesn't matter what our lives spoke of. 20 years, 10 years, 5 years down the line, it doesn't matter what our lives spoke of. Today, it can all change and be a story of victory. Anybody with me still? I'm like, hey, just make sure if you're going to do anything, fall asleep, don't burn something, okay? (laughs) Who knows the world is not looking for somebody with a title? They're not looking for somebody who has position. They're looking for somebody who has a voice and something that matters to say. I think about, like, I love looking into the great moves, not even just the great moves of God, but the great moves of humanity, basically of like when something was injustice, somebody said, hey, this is not okay. My life matters. My life has a voice, and my life is going to speak something that's going to change culture, change history. And often it's not people who had the position. It's often not people who said like, hey, I've got the title, so let me do the work. They're like, hey, no, hold on. I simply just have the answer that the world needs. And I look at you and I know for myself, is like, we have the answer that the world needs. The world is looking for something and you and I have the answer and it is revealed by how we live and how we, lo- how we walk this thing out with Jesus. You know that when people see you and they see your past redeemed, it actually gives them hope. I love, I love the stories and the testimonies of people in their darkest moments finding Jesus because it's like if they found it, if Jesus did it once, he'll do it again. Oh, come on. I was, like, I was like a lob over home plate and just bam. <laughs> if he's done it once, he'll do it. Okay. Boom, there it is. You guys are so good. I love it. But our past redeem gives hope to people who look at their lives and say, where can I go from here? And it's like, hold on, let me show you where I came from. I'm going to own my story. I'm not going to say like, hey, this was my life. Yes, I came out of sin, but this is where I am now. It doesn't mean we have to celebrate where we were, but it says like, hey, this was real. And I needed Jesus. And if you need Jesus, I know where to find him. He's always been there. I love this morning. It's just like I'm sitting there thinking, like before I can get to the altar, he went to a cross. The whole story of God is him pursuing us, not us pursuing him. That's the gospel. That's what the world is looking for. They're looking for somebody to come to them rather than somebody to say, hey, you need to come to us. And if we own our story and we say, hey, I'm going to be vulnerable I'm going to be authentic. I'm not going to say I have it all together. I'm simply going to say there was a moment in my life where I realized my life mattered and it started with Jesus. Jesus is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people to show up. He's not looking for availability. He's simply, uh, sorry, he's not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. Like, I love the disciples because it gives me hope. (laughs) Because I'm like, if he can use them, whoo, we're going to have a good day today. Because think about it, like, none of them are extremely educated. 
Like, I look at him, I'm like, Jesus, um, man, like, if I'm doing a draft here, like, I would have picked some different people. <laughs> and he simply just goes by the water and says, hey, you, follow me. I'm like, that's all you're going to say? Like, who do you, what if you get the wrong person? <laughs> what if you get, like, you know, Seymour over here is like, oh, what did you say? I'll come. And you're like, no, you weren't supposed to be there. You weren't in them. He's just like, hey, you, follow me. See, your life is speaking a message right now. You're fishermen, but I'm going to change your life so that it speaks a message that will actually change history. Like, I, I love that. In one moment, their message changed. And if today you're feeling like, you know what? Hey, I'm okay with my message. It's an all right message. It doesn't have to be a bad message. It might just be a ordinary message and you're like I would love an upgrade he simply says hey follow me he doesn't need ability he doesn't need you to be a pastor in a church he doesn't need you to be a worship leader in a church although if you need that here sign up (laughs) he's simply looking for availability he's looking for the people who say hey I simply just burn with passion for a generation who does not know you. There's so much power in just showing up. So good. Love it. If you ever hear a pastor say so good, it's because they lost track, just so you know. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, I need to get to my notes. But if we're going to speak a message that gives hope and transforms this world we actually need to know truth you can't speak truth unless unless you know truth if you ask me to come up here and teach you algebra it'll be a very quick class and we'll go to gym (laughs) but in order to know truth you have to know what truth is and who knows truth is not an ideology truth is not a really good message truth is a person amen Truth is Jesus. I love it in John. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's like, okay, I can take that one. I figured that one out. That's good. Like, he's the truth. And who knows that our lives are being determined by one of two worlds. The way we think is being determined by one or two worlds. Lies or truths. It's usually kind of like a a testy statement but we are actually not in a fight against evil and good 2,000 years ago good one (laughs) evil's been running with their tail between their between their legs ever since we're not even in a battle between light and dark when I flip the switch darkness doesn't put up a fight there's like never a conversation like oh fine you had it yesterday I'll give it to you today (laughs) No, like darkness leaves and we have light. What we are in a battle of is will we believe truth or will we believe lies? And which is crazy is to think that if I believe lies, I actually partner with the liar. So if I believe the lie over my life that I have nothing to say, my voice doesn't matter, my life doesn't matter, then I will partner with what the enemy has said over my life. But the opposite is true. If I partner with truth, if I allow my world to be shaped by truth, I will partner with who Jesus says I am, who he is, what he is doing in my life, and what he has done in my life. And that when I partner with truth, I'm, a, I'm able, I'm equipped to have a message that actually has something to offer this world. Who knows the world is looking for truth? Sometimes they think they found it, but if it doesn't look like Jesus, it's not truth. It can be facts, but it might not be truth. There's a, a youth pastor in, in Bethel, at, uh, in Reading at Bethel Church. And he has this quote. And he says, The voice you let shape you will be the voice that speaks through you. Just so you know, I'm not checking the score. Just checking time. Yep. Good. Okay. The voice you let shape you will be the voice that speaks through you.
if I'm shaped by truth, if I am shaped by what Jesus is saying about me, that will be the voice that is speaking through me. I love it. It's, this is the gospel, that no matter what your life speaks today, there's room for it to speak something else. If your life once spoke fear, today it could speak courage. If it once spoke shame, today it could speak freedom. If it once spoke doubt, today it could speak faith. If it once spoke rejection, today it could speak acceptance. If it once spoke sinner, today it can speak saint. This is the moment that everything changes. Who knows that a movement is simply just made of little moments. And all it takes is one moment to create a movement. If we want to see the movement of the kingdom of God on this earth, it's going to happen with moments where we say, hey, my life once spoke shame, but today it's going to speak truth. I'm not going to let this moment pass because my life matters, my voice matters, and I have a message that can change the world. And wherever that is, whatever your area of influence is, it could be your workplace, it could be changing diapers. Amen. <laughs> it could be at school. But if you want to change the environment you're in, you're going to have to say, hey, I have an answer. You know that God had a dream? I feel like Martin Luther. But God had a dream. And it was that none would perish, that all would come to know him. And you and I are who he plans to use to see that dream come true. Like, let's just, let's, I'm like closing right now. Allow that to sink in though. That's crazy. That God had a dream. Before all of this started, he had a dream that all would come to know him. That none would perish. And you and I, with our long resumes, <laughs> it's like, you chose me to make your dream come true. You said that your life mattered so much. You said that my life mattered so much. The message he put inside my life was the exact answer to see his dream come true on this earth. I'm going to leave you with this quote. It says, uh, from Maya Angelou, it says, I've learned that people will forget what you have said, people will forget what you have done, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And love will always be the loudest voice in the room. And I see it in this church already. I see it in this family. That's your heart. And if anything that I can do today is to say, you're going the right direction. You weren't called to lead a good church. As leaders and pastors, we're not called to lead a good church. We're called to lead a community. We're called to father and mother nations. We're called to reveal ourselves as sons and daughters and simply say, Today, love will be the loudest voice in the room. You will forget what I've done for you. You'll forget what I've said, but I promise you as a community in Espanola, they will not forget the way that you made them feel. So good. That's what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're physically able. You're like, twice in one Sunday. Come on. I'm telling you, hey, if I'm not exercising, i got to make somebody else exercise. So good. Turn to your neighbor and say, I have a voice. I have a voice. Hey, we're getting so much louder. It's so good. <laughs> and turn to your other neighbor and say, and it matters. <laughs> if you don't have a neighbor, I know it's like the most awkward thing in church ever. You're like, turn to your neighbor and like, I am sitting by myself. Thank you, sir. Ha, ha, ha.
Uh-oh, it's trouble now. I'm, I'm with the, now it's time to close. But your life matters. And you and I are God's plan A. We're not plan B. His plan has always been that this world would look like heaven. And he's not doing it through this big conference. I love conferences. He's not doing it even even through Bible studies. I love Bible studies. He's not doing it through this great, young, good-looking pastor getting up here and speaking and Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Modest, I know. Humble, so humble. Oh, I heard that. <laughs> but what he's doing it through is people who are willing to say, hey, I will let my life speak. And I will let it speak something of hope. I will let it speak a message of faith, of acceptance, and of, of love to people who need to hear a message. 